Stalker, an original short story by Alina Abrosimova. Mark glanced at Lucy one more time before closing the apartment's door behind him. She was still sprawled on the couch, staring at the TV, her mouth set in a bitter grimace, tears pooling in the corners of her eyes. There was nothing else to say, he thought, his steps soft and careful on the carpeted stairs as he ran down to the exit. He never knew what to say anyway, just standing there awkwardly and trying to make jokes that she ignored, or being logical or quiet or pacing the room in agitation, nothing helped. What started the argument today? He wasn't sure. Did he leave a mug on the coffee table after having his usual long black in the morning? Did he say something inappropriate or insensitive? Did he hint at her shortcomings or show his annoyance, mild as it was? It didn't matter. He now expected her outbursts, her tantrums and mood swings. They grew as familiar as the smell of her perfume, and whatever he did, there would always be something to provoke her temper. He reached the bottom of the steps and opened the door leading outside. The night air was humid and sweet. It smelled like the ocean and gardenias. It smelled like freedom. Mark put the headphones into his ears, unlocked the screen of his smartphone, and opened the app that tracked his runs. GPS reception? Fair, it said. At least something is fair, he thought and smiled. I should tell Pam. She would appreciate the joke he thought. Hey Pam, I decided to go for a run. Great night for it. He typed and hit send. There was no response, but that was okay. He didn't expect any, at least not yet. At times she was busy and couldn't reply straight away. She was a busy girl, Pam. Hectic job. Lots of friends, hobbies, and adventures. You couldn't expect her to be available at all times. Mark pressed start in the running app, and a song he didn't recognize started playing in his headphones. That was his cue to start running, and he couldn't help feeling that he was not just jogging, but fleeing from the crying young woman in his apartment. Lucy, Lucy, what can I do? It was three months since Lucy's uncle Victor had died in his hometown in the Czech Republic. He was in his 60s and judging by the only photo Lucy had, an alcoholic, which was hardly surprising, Mark thought, considering his Eastern European origins. Mark was slightly alarmed by Lucy's reaction when she heard that Victor died. She couldn't say anything to her mother for a while. She was crying till she started hiccuping tears and snot running down her face, and her mother waited patiently on the other side of the phone in a faraway country. When words finally came back to Lucy, she said she would come to Victor's funeral and simply hung up. Are you all right? Mark had asked. No, not really, she had said, her lower lip quivering. He was my uncle. I, I loved him. They were silent for a long while. When is the funeral? In three days. So what's that, Thursday? And the funeral is in Prague, right? Of course it's in Prague. You think they're going to move his corpse to bury him somewhere else? Mark had been taken aback by the tone of her response. They had never had big arguments about anything, not prior to their marriage. Not after it. He was silent for a long while, thinking, then opened the laptop and looked up flights to Prague and back. The only flights available from Sydney to Prague were in business class, with two layovers. The price made him suck in the air through his lips. They didn't have that kind of money, not without getting even deeper into debt. Lucy was a full-time student, redefining herself in her late twenties after a long series of meaningless jobs in retail, and he was a slightly older office worker, with no special skills, barely a mid-level employee, with a salary to match. Besides. This was not about a parent or a sibling or even a grandparent. This was about an uncle with a big red nose covered with enlarged veins, eyes staring meaninglessly into space. The more Mark thought about it, the more Lucy's grief struck him as something unnatural and even perverse. 
Ugly theories about possible reasons for such grief were forming in his head, but he pushed them away. He did tell Lucy that she couldn't go to the funeral, though. I'll ask my parents for money, she said, staring at him. So he had to explain that the money wouldn't be transferred fast enough, that her parents already struggled to keep themselves afloat financially and asking them for money would be irresponsible and cruel. He also said, gently he thought, that it would be different if it was about her parents, but this was an uncle, and as sad as it was, they could not afford flying to another country because of a distant relative, especially a dead one. Lucy cried and protested, talking about Victor's compassion and encouragement through her difficult teenage years, but that only strengthened Mark's resolution, and he persevered, picturing the veins on the uncle's nose, his crooked grin, and beady eyes, and eventually Lucy grew silent and sat down on the kitchen floor, hugging her knees and looking even smaller than usual. He knew he won then and felt relieved. That was the first time when he put his foot down and stood his ground, disregarding Lucy's protests and tears. And in his book, it was a cause for private celebration, even if it happened in unfortunate circumstances. Lucy moped for weeks after that, listless and barely there. She no longer followed her morning ritual of trying new hairstyles in front of the mirror. She would change into her pajamas immediately after getting home, not displaying any interest in Mark or anything else around her. She told him once that she felt isolated, completely alone, but refused to go out and spend time with other people. One day, a couple of Lucy's girlfriends convinced her to have dinner with them, and she had come home tipsy, giggling and flirty, rubbing against him and seducing him with French kisses. He disliked the taste of alcohol on her hot breath, and her tongue felt strangely intrusive in his mouth, so he politely withdrew. She flinched as if he slapped her, looking at him in disbelief, then walked to the bedroom and slammed the door behind her. He slept on the couch and left quietly in the morning without saying goodbye. When he came home, she dashed to the door to meet him, and they made up right there and then. Still, after that, arguments seemed to flare up all the time, almost every day, as if their very first serious fight opened a floodgate. There were occasional good days when they didn't argue. Mark avoided mentioning their problems then and just enjoyed their time together. They went for walks and chatted about everything and nothing while holding hands and trying to get lost in the back streets of their suburb, and the warm air hugged them like a fleece blanket. Then the next day, he could do no right. He was insensitive, inappropriate, incorrect, and she looked at him with deep mistrust in her eyes, questioning him on every step and hurling accusations at him while he looked at her dumbfounded and lost. That's when he started commenting on new entries at Pam's blog. He was jogging for a while now, breathing greedily. He was getting very close to the area where Pam lived. He checked his phone to make sure that there weren't any replies from her and sent another instant message. The air is very pleasant today. Maybe I will run into you by accident again. Pam and Mark studied in uni together about ten years before he stumbled on her blog while checking a social network for graduates. Back in uni they used to have coffee together and have little chats. They never dated or even hinted at dating, but he thought they had a connection of sorts. At the very least, time always seemed to flow faster and a bit more effortlessly when they were together. They never exchanged phone numbers. Mark heard that Pam went away on a long backpacking trip right after graduation. His everyday life took over his thoughts, and he forgot about her altogether until one day, when he was already married to Lucy, he came across her blog. The blog was about traveling and adventures and just random amusing stuff. Pam was majorly into rock climbing, and the blog was full of photos, mountaintops, beautiful landscapes, Pam brimming with happiness, always tanned, her smile cheeky as if challenging her readers to do something out of the ordinary, something exciting and so far out of their comfort zone that they can't be sure that they will ever get back. She wrote about caves and long hikes and the thoughts that visited her when she came back home. How lost you can get in your own little worries and a thousand tiny, insignificant decisions that form the fabric of your life and make you too tired to think of the big stuff. 
Sometimes, she talked about death and her friends who were into extreme sports, risking their lives for the adrenaline rush and that moment when you feel like you're immortal just because you're ready to throw your life away. Pam wrote well, though infrequently, and her blog had a bunch of loyal followers. Mark became one of them. He always read her blog at work, from the very start. There was no particular reason to hide it. Lucy never seemed jealous, and he had no intentions of getting back in touch with Pam. He enjoyed reading her blog, not as much for her musings as for the general comforting feeling of being part of a different life through her. It felt intimate somehow, and at times he went to bed with a smile on his face that had nothing to do with Lucy, and had everything to do with Pam. He had a harmless, meaningless addiction to a blog that got updated every other week. That was all. When things between him and Lucy went sore, he was waiting for the updates on Pam's blog as if it were a rare ray of sunshine in the deepest cave under the sea. At least, that's how he thought of it. All the troubles of the world could wait while he greedily consumed a new blog entry. He then reread it again, slowly this time, hovering over every word, soaking it all in. All his comments were anonymous, but Mark was sure that Pam knew it was the same person. At first, he just wrote that he enjoyed the blog and found a particular paragraph especially amusing or enlightening. Pam usually thanked him for the compliment. After a while, he started dreaming about her. Nothing crude, all he thought about was an immediate connection that would spark between them if they met, a quiet understanding that didn't quite require any wordy explanations. He started going for a jog after work, listening to music and thinking about her. He avoided thinking about Lucy as much as he could. That was too painful. It required solutions that he didn't have and decisions that he didn't want to make. Pam belonged to a different world, more pure and more perfect, more cheerful and welcoming to everyone, but especially to him. So he mentioned that they should have a coffee together again sometime in his next comment. Pam didn't react the way he expected. She asked who exactly she was talking with. Mark made a joke out of it and wrote that he went jogging around her house every night. In reality, back then, he only knew the suburb where she lived, since she mentioned it in her blog once. He was pleasantly surprised that it wasn't that far from his place and made a point of jogging around the area when he could. Pam didn't take his comment very well. She called it stalkerish. That gave him pause. His memory of her included a healthy sense of humor, and her blog confirmed it. Could she not see that he was joking? In his mind, she was so close to him, not just in memories but in everyday thoughts, that he couldn't imagine her not feeling anything in return. She wrote in her blog that she had trouble going to sleep for the last couple of months, and it reminded him of a curious idea he read somewhere. When you can't go to sleep, it means that someone out there is thinking about you. With all the thinking he did about Pam, no wonder she couldn't go to sleep. He apologized about his comment, saying that he didn't mean it that way. I should really just tell you who I am. Enough hiding, he said. Pam didn't reply, so he didn't volunteer any further information. A couple of days later, he added her to his contact list in Instant Messenger. Hi, Pam. Remember me? Haven't seen you for ages. What have you been up to? She responded almost immediately, greeting him and then asking whether it was him who left the comments on her blog. He avoided the question, trying to engage her in a conversation instead, but eventually he had to admit that it was. I've been going through hard times lately, he said. With your wife? She guessed, and he dodged the question again. So, I'm not sure what it is exactly what you want from me, smiley face, she said, and he assured her that he only wanted friendship and that it couldn't possibly be about anything else. She did not reply. Mark checked his phone again, still nothing from Pam. A text from Lucy. You've been gone for a long time. You coming home at all? He ignored it. It was getting harder to jog and he considered walking for a while. He could see the townhouse Pam rented with two flatmates on the other side of the street. 
When they did meet after exchanging those few initial messages, it was entirely by accident. He got used to jogging in Pam's suburb. It was quiet, but not ominously so. An occasional car going through a roundabout, train announcements barely audible in the distance. He saw other runners every now and again, sidestepping politely while he jogged past the line of gum trees growing on the side of the road. That night, he saw her walking toward him, deep in thought, headphones in her ears, and at first he couldn't believe his eyes. It was really her. It was dark, and a streetlight cast deep shadows on her face. When she saw that he stopped, she looked up at him with worry and concern until recognition crept into her face. Hello, Pam, he said. Oh, hi, Mark. I'm just going for a walk after Jim, a bit tired. Oh, cool. Can I walk with you? Not for long. Sure, I guess. Silence. I wasn't really stalking you, Pam, he said. I just jog here because I live at St. Peter's around the corner. She glanced at him and smiled. Okay, that's a relief. Mark couldn't remember the rest of the conversation that night. Pam was exhausted after work in the gym and didn't look as cheerful as her photos, but she still had that same cheeky smile and she still teased him a little. He thought it might not have been conscious, that behavior. It was just who she was. A cheeky and playful kid radiating light around her like a little torch, even if she didn't feel that good herself. What a contrast with Lucy. No, it was wrong to think that way. He walked Pam to her place, and she seemed more comfortable around him when she said goodbye. He ran all the way home and hugged Lucy the moment he got there, burying his burning face in her hair and whispering that he loved her forever, no matter what much to her stunned consternation. Now he was standing across the street from Pam's house, looking at the frangipani tree growing in the front yard. It was dark so he could just make out white spots of flowers here and there, but he knew that the ground under the trees was covered with petals. The tiny lawn was undoubtedly neat. He knew from Pam's blog that one of her flatmates cut the grass with scissors. There was no point of getting a lawnmower for such a tiny piece of land. Cutting grass with scissors also felt like meditation to some people, apparently, although Mark couldn't relate to that. The warmly glowing windows of the house seemed to call out to him. Two weeks before that, when Pam got a flu, he didn't hesitate. He bought some oranges and yogurts, walked to her house, and rang the door. When there was no answer, he put the bags on the doormat and left. Check outside your door, he messaged her. OMG, wow! I can't believe you did that! Thanks! Pam replied. I had no food at home. Too sick to go out and my flatmates are both away. Anything else you need? No, please, you've done enough! He let it go then, feeling that pushing too hard would alienate her yet again. She replied to him more readily for a few days after that, and then the messages stopped again. It just feels weird, she wrote. We don't really know each other. You message me a lot, and I... I don't understand what it all means. We are not really friends. What's the point? Mark didn't have an answer for her, but in his mind the answer wasn't needed. There was no point, but is there ever any point in what we carry in our hearts? His dreams, his thoughts, his best intentions, it all belonged to Pam. And if that didn't matter, what did? His phone rang. It was Lucy. Hello? Mark, baby? She paused and he realized with a tinge of annoyance that she was crying. I think I'm depressed. He looked at Pam's house, warm, welcoming, and happy, so full of possibilities, an entirely different life. I'm just spiraling, like I'm falling all the time and I can't do anything about it, she said. I need your help, please. Help me. Calm down, babe, he heard himself saying. It's not that bad, I'm on my way home. He hung up but didn't move. His breath was shallow from jogging, but when he sighed, he could smell the frangipani from across the road. He knew that going home was the only thing left to do, and he knew he would do it. He just wasn't quite ready yet.
Thank you for listening to Stalker, an original short story by Alina Ebrosimova and produced by me, Jared I. McGee. Alina Ebrosimova is originally from Tomsk, Russia. Think Siberia, not to be confused with Serbia, but currently resides in Sydney, Australia. She sails as much as she can, though she is often interrupted by a pesky full-time job. When not sailing or working, she enjoys writing, reading, learning new things, especially all things impractical, and getting to know people, especially positive people who share her unending curiosity about our world. You can see more from Miss Abrosimova at her blog, Sales and Commas, found at salesandcommas.wordpress.com. Both backing tracks for this story come from PC3. The first is titled Through the Storm, and the second titled Klitschy. Both were taken from the Free Music Archive and are being used under a Creative Commons Attribution 4.0 International License. Thank you to PC3 and the Free Music Archive for their contribution. And with that, we conclude Episode 17 of Prose. I hope you've enjoyed this week's tales, and please do keep your eyes peeled for more episodes coming next Sunday. Until next week, goodbye. <laughs>